She was the kind of person that keeps a parrot. Part three, Colorado Rear Black Knight Trilogy, starring our very own Hyacinth Macaw Parrot and Resident Witch Princess Tara. We'll be reading part one of chapter one. Riding a redoubtable pterodactyl big as a giraffe into the sky never grows old, especially when the creature possesses the equipment to turn you into snack food. The pterodactyl, to Sutli, king of the underworld, banked to the south over Elliott Bay to ascend the Duwamish River. I rubbed the shaggy, long, black hair covered neck of the gadget, the name in these parts for the winged creatures, with one hand, while I grasped a clump of his hair with my other, bringing to mind my bareback riding days during my college years in Idaho horse country. The behemoth craned his long neck to peer back at me, Brilliant spring sunshine illuminating his eyes like burning coal embers. They are coming, Master, the gadget repeated his warning. I struggled to hear the creature's words over the slow, steady beat of half a dozen pairs of enormous wings pounding the air like pile drivers. Charlie called out to me from his mount. What the monsters say? Charlie is the Charlie of Charlie's Bird Store. Charlie's Bird Store is the bird store at the market. Seattle speaks for the world-renowned Pike Place Market. Where I first, where I first encountered the gorgeous cobalt blue-feathered Hyson Macaw Parrot Princess Tara. The parrot had turned out to be a witch with a coffee addiction. But you know that already. To suit as a gadget, I yelled back at Charlie. What? Charlie looked mighty uncomfortable, his lanky blue polyester tactical suit covered frame bouncing up and down on his gadget's spiny neck. When he wasn't yelling questions at me, Charlie seemed to be holding his breath, grasping pumps of the gadget's hair between his legs with both hands, hanging on for dear life. This is Tasutli, king of the underworld, I yelled back. These monsters. Tasuli craned his neck to peer back at me. Again, his great beak pressed into a noticeable scowl. These creatures are called gadgets in Northwest Coast lore. Charlie threw me a sideways glance, his wide eyes askance. They're friggin' flying lizards soon as eat you as look at you. Do you know of any lizards with hair? Michael cried out from the next pterodactyl. Huh? Charlie grunted. Reluctantly turning his head to glare at Michael, decked out in khakis and corduroys like he was on his way to teach a class. Dr. Michael Bulgakov, Associate Professor of History at the UW University of Washington's History Department. My best friend not named Jean, former office mate back in the day we both struggled to achieve tenure. They're mammals, Michael expl explained. Charlie shook his head. Lizards, mammals, they all, they still look to eat you, he insisted. These monsters, as you call them, are our, our friends, Lutara called out, riding her Mount Sea Waddle. Queen of the Underworld, to suit his mate. Treat them with the respect they are due. They may save your life. Yes, ma'am, Charlie grudgingly replied, turning his eyes forward to admire the fur and cedar shrouded scenery sliding below us. I pivoted my torso astride to suit his neck to admire Blue Tara. I don't know how anyone could not admire Blue Tara. Her crystalline blue skin, cat bike billowing black hair, glowed like the rainy glacier in the unobstructed spring sun, just beginning to descend toward the Olympic Mountains to our west. Blue Tara grasped the clump of sea waddle's hair with one hand. Her other hand grasped with battle axe strapped to a leather belt around her waist to keep her blade from bouncing against her thigh. I knew from experience Blue Tara knew how to use the battle axe. Mother of all the Taras, a shape-shifting witch, an Amazonian goddess. Not in the rainforest sense, but in the Jason and the Argonauts sense. Blue Tara had just one gleaming yellow eye, a vicious scar cutting across her face where, other, where her other eye should be. Because she tended not to wear clothes other than the leather belt around her waist for her battle axe, anyone could see Blue Tara had only one breast, the other severed some ancient battle with a mortal enemy leaving an ugly scar across her chest. Blutar's magic included the ability to manifest herself as an enormous hyacinth macaw parrot named Princess Tara, dressed in gorgeous cobalt blue feathers. This day, Blutar rode into potential battle fully dressed. I suppressed a laugh. I, I studied one improbable creature, Blue Tara, her glistening body shielded by paint-spotted carpet or pants, a pen on a shirt, and a Tim Filson guide jacket, the flaps of the coat fluttering in the wind. This improbable creature straddled the neck of another improbable creature, a winged behemoth, a gadget, what some would call a pterodactyl. Antediluvian scales shielded by a coat of shaggy long black hair, greasy like fur, billowing in the wind like a loose wheat field. Do not be so comfortable with your ride, you fall off your mount, a woman's voice laughed at me from a gadget trailing behind. I craned my neck to search for the voice. The voice belonged to Blutara's younger sister, Abigail, one day destined to be a Blutara like Blutara. A smile bright as her gleaming crystalline blue skin greeted me. Abigail appeared a spitting image of her older sister. Except anyone could see Abigail possessed two eyes and two breasts, not shielded by clothing nor scarred by battle. 
Abigail's crystal and blue skin gleamed so bright in the unobstructed sunlight my eyes watered to look at her. Abigail grasped a sword of shimmering blue steel against her thigh instead of a battle axe, a longbow draped across her back. Abigail also possessed the magic to manifest, manifest herself as the gorgeous cobalt blue felled hyacinth macaw parrot, when not in the form of a naked crystalline blue-skinned Amazonian goddess. My sister is correct, blue tar equipped. I turned my, head, my eyes back to her. Watch you hold on to your mount. You would suffer a hard fall if you slipped off the king of the underworld, my betrothed. A great grin broke across Lutar's face. I would not wish to lose you so soon after our betrothment. Lutar burst out laughing so hard her mount see Waddle craned her long neck to peer back at her in astonishment. I could hear Charlie echo Blutar's laughter. I could feel my face flush. Rather than dignify Blutar's jive with a response, I turned my head to confirm we had not lost any of our complement of pterodactyls and riders. I found to my satisfaction that the flock, or Terran, as Michael liked to call them, pandemonium of parrots, coven of crows, murder of ravens, and tacks. Kirka trailed Abigail, eyes focused intently on the mountain. Seattle speak for Mount Rainier, looming before us. Kirka is a slight woman, witch of magic, which is a sore point with her. She discovered she possessed the ability to turn people into critters or statues and vice versa. She was not too happy about the, that discovery, thinking being a witch made her a freak of nature. A small white parrot with yellow highlights on her feathers, a cockatoo rode Kirka's shoulder. White tar, the tar of healing. The highest macaw parrot Abigail belongs to Kirka. That's complicated, I know. White tar threw me a sly whistle upon spotting me eyeing her. White tar manifested herself as a statuesque goddess with skin white as fresh cascade powder snow, capped with a crown of wild pink hair, draped in a plethora of silk skirts and scars, bright as a rainbow to accentuate her sculpted body. In her goddess form, White Tara boasted not two, not three, not even four, but seven eyes. Three eyes on her forehead, additional eyes on each hand and foot. To suit the commenced to honk like the distilled call of a flock of Canadian geese, snapping my attention forward to the object of our journey. I almost fell off my mountain, shocked to find my Mount Rainier soaring above us in gleaming glacial brilliance. I feared we might crash into the mountain. I couldn't believe how quickly the gadgets covered the 60-mile distance from Seattle. Wings outstretched, the gadgets rode the currents of air rising up the side of the mountain to climb for the summit, targeting the lenticular cloud anchored to the mountain's peak. Our destination, the home world of the bird people, the crystal city of Duluaxa. The temperature plunged climbing the mountain. I pulled the zipper of my Eddie Bauer to my neck. My body shook both from the chill and the anticipation of what and who I would find there. We flew up the carbon glacier so close to the ice I felt I could scoop ice up with my fingers. My teeth began to chatter from the cold. I regretted not wearing a heavier jacket. Descending into a lenticular cloud capping the mountain's peak, I started to lose feeling in my fingers. I struggled to maintain a grasp of Tsutli's hair. The moment I feared losing my grip and sliding off the pterodactyl to an icy doom, we burst back into blazing sunshine. I found myself sweating, but I didn't, did not dare release my hold on Tsutli's hair to try to unzip my jacket. Oh my god, I heard Charlie cry out. I peered ahead. The great crystal wall of the crystal city of Dulaxa towered before us, disappearing from view into the sky. The crystal plains surrounding the city shimmered with every color of the rainbow from sunlight refracted through the crystal wall. Wings outstretched, the gadgets noiselessly glided to a landing near the city. Goosebumps crawled up my back in response to the eerie silence that greeted us. An alarm bell buried deep within my brain commenced to tinkle. The gadgets folded their great wings against their bodies. The tars dismounted. I swung my leg off to suit his neck like I dismounted from a horse. I dropped to the crystal surface. Charlie and Michael struggled off their mounts. Kirka remained seated, white tar perched on his shoulder. Charlie's blue polyester tactical suit, bathed in the iridescent light streaming through the crystal wall, glowed bright as blue tar's skin. Charlie placed his fingers against the wall. His eyes traced the wall into the sky. Tell me something, boss, he said without turning his head. Stop calling me boss, for Christ's sakes, I snapped. This ain't the South. Charlie turned to look at me, a grin across his face. Sorry, boss, uh, son. Old habits die hard. What do you want me to tell you? Charlie bent his head back to stare up the wall toward the heavens. How is something like this even here? I am sure Kay, Kinko, Kinko Lala, the black witch, one of the shape-shifting bird people of Duolaxa, the Tlugwala, guardian of the Tlugwi, the object of our journey to this remarkable place. A yeah. glum mood washed over me. I stared at my hands, the very hands that killed her. I shook my head, trying to collect my thoughts. I am sure Kay can explain that to you better than I can. We flew those friggin' pterodactyls right over Bowling Field. Charlie waved his hand off to the north, at least where Bowling Field should have been. How come planes don't crash into this place every day? Charlie threw his hands into the air in exasperation. Blutar replied for me. This world exists in a different vortex of time. She waved toward the gadgets, as do the winged creatures who brought us here. Charlie replied with a low whistle of grudging acceptance to a reality he could not comprehend. He turned back to the wall. 
How do we get inside? Is there a magic incantation? Charlie took a step back, hands to his hips. Like open sesame? This isn't a fairy tale, I started to reply. My jaw fell to my chest, an opening appeared at the base of the wall. <gasps> oh my god, Kirk exclaimed. She jumped off her gadget. Kirk's flaming red hair contrasted with her drab jeans, plaid Pendleton shirt, and dark canvas jacket. Kirk strode to Charlie's side. Utara <clears throat> waved off the gadgets. The pterodactyls turned away from us. Wings flapping, the gadgets leaped into the sky to disappear into the fog bank, roiling over the edge of the crystal plain. What are you doing, woman? Charlie cried out. They're getting away. They will be safe, Mutara assured Charlie. How did you do that, Michael asked. Do what, Charlie and I responded. Open the door. I did that, a woman's voice. Familiar yet surprising, answered from the doorway. Charlie spun to the voice. The fuck, he exclaimed. How did you get here? He pumped a shotgun in his hands. I spun to the voice. Callie stood in the opening. High heels, midnight blue wool business suit, the color of the suit matched her skin. Skin so dark the skin seemed to suck light out of the sky. I had trouble distinguishing the boundary between skin and fabric. Flaming red eyes, the only part of her not dark. Untamed frizzle black hair billowed from her head. Always overdressing for the wrong occasions, I quipped. Callie, goddess of death, or witch, take your pick, which word do you prefer? Region of Seattle, personally appointed by dear leader following the abolishment of civil gov governments across the country. Tasked with suppressing the resistance centered around the covenant witches known as the Taras, led by Blue Tara. Callie's enforcer, the black leather clad red skinned witch Red Tara, the Tara of Destruction, stood behind Callie, a grin splitting her face from ear to ear. A halo of smoke and flame seemed to waft off Red Tara's radioactively red hair. Callie stepped forward. Charlie pulled the trigger of his shotgun. He pumped a weapon. Charlie pulled the trigger again, and a third time. The slugs reached as far as Callie's outstretched hand and stopped to float in the air. Callie batted down each slug. Callie's hand flashed out to seize Charlie's throat. The shotgun crashed to his feet. Callie lifted Charlie into the air. Charlie gasped for breath. His fingers scratched at Callie's arms to try to break her grip. Charlie's face turned ashen. His fingers slipped from Callie's arms to fall limp to his sides. Enough, Callie screamed into Charlie's face, loud enough to wake the dead. You are all of you beneath me. I am a goddess, you dull creature, and I shall not be bullied by. Callie disappeared. Charlie's body collapsed to the crystal plane. Callie's midnight blue wool business suit collapsed in a heap onto Charlie's body. What the fuck? Michael cried out, his voice matching his face in yeah. shock and surprise. I wanted to jump to Charlie's side. My muscles refused to respond to my brain's command. Kelly's empty suit jacket commenced to spring up and fall down as if covering a bouncing ball. Michael reached down to grasp a flap. He pulled the jacket open. A very animated toad sprung out to land at Kirka's feet. Kirka lifted her foot. The toad commenced to croak. Kirka smashed her boot on the toad. She lifted her foot to study the remains of the critter stuck to the sole of her boot. Puny goddess, Kirka said flatly, a grin stretched across her face. God damn, I remarked, my brain tried to process what my eyes showed me. Guess she did not see that coming, Roxanne quipped. Roxanne stepped out of the opening in the crystal wall. Kirka scooped up Charlie's shotgun. She pointed the barrel at Roxanne. I'm guessing you cannot stop bullets. Roxanne grabbed the barrel to point the weapon out of the sky. I am not here to hinder you. Please do not attempt to turn me into a toad. Unlike the Witch of Death, I am prepared for your magic. Michael dropped to his knees at Charlie's side. He flung Kelly's clothing off Charlie's body. What the hell just happened, he asked, his eyes jumping from person to person, pleading for explanation. Michael pressed his fingers to Charlie's neck, feeling for a pulse. He's dead, he cried out. The white cockatoo parrot, White Tara, the Tara of Healing, flitted off Kirk's shoulder to light on Michael's. White Tara pressed her beak into Michael's chin. You should know better than that, dear one, the parrot told Michael. Wings outstretched, White Tara jumped off Michael's shoulder. Floating over Charlie's body, she stretched up her head, beak gaping wide. A screech like a thunderclap burst into the sky, shaking the crystal wall of the city of Dulaloxa. I fell to my knees, eyes squeezed shut, hands pressed to my ears. Mary, Mother of God, I heard Charlie exclaim. My eyes popped open. I found Michael rolled onto his side, hands pressed to his ears, face writhing in pain. I found Charlie sitting up. His hands grasped White Tara's, his face ashen, eyes wide in wonder. White Tara stood before him, not the white parrot, but the white goddess. Skin white as the glacier we just flew over, a crown of wild pink hair. A riot of silk skirts and scarves billowing off her statuesque body, colorful as any rainbow. I could, see star I could see Charlie staring at her third eye in the center of her forehead. He jumped back when the eye winked at him, dropping White Tara's hands. White Tar Charlie jumped again when he saw the eyes on the palms of her hands winking at him. Michael and I grasped Charlie's arms to help him to his feet. Arms outstretched, White Tara dissolved into the white parrot that flipped back to Kirk's shoulder. Damn, son, I'm getting tired of that, Charlie said with a sigh. Tired of what, I asked. Tired of getting killed. No kidding, I chuckled. A twittering within Kelly's empty suit jacket caught our attention. The twittering of a songbird. <laughs>